Okay, so we come to the closing presentation of the, the symposium. We are running quite, uh, quite late on the predicted schedule, but the speakers were so fair, sort of uh, fascinating, and discussion was so so good that I, I at the one time I sort of let, let, let the time go that I think we should uh, stick with the, the content, and not uh, not not go too hard on the, the time itself. So it's, it's a great pleasure to uh, once again we introduce. Uh, uh, Dr. David Gil Martin, who is a distinguished professor of history at North Carolina State University. Uh, we are going to do a little book launch uh, of his, uh, his book, a uh, recent book uh, known as Blood and Water, the Indus Water Basin in Modern History. This came out in 2015, and I am somewhat disappointed that it did not get the attention that it really deserves. Uh, uh, because, uh, I mean, I, I, I read it uh, recently, it was like really exhilarating. Uh, sort of a read, summarizing so many of the things that we uh, that we heard uh, today, and I, I think I would let uh, uh, Professor Bill Martin uh, talk more about the book. But what what I'm beginning to get a feeling is that probably we need uh, uh, you can say um, different narratives to engage with the with the young uh, young community and, and professionals and and uh, uh, practitioners in, in different disciplines because the message needs to get out. I mean, these, these, these excursions into history, these, these, these are not sort of, uh, uh, these should, shouldn't be uh, discussed in small groups, in, in small economic circles. The, uh, uh, the purpose really is to uh, look at these, these larger problems in, in sort of multifaceted ways. And then I think from that perspective, this particular book, I would recommend to, to the audience as a particularly eye opening read. So I, without further ado, I would like to ask Professor Gil Martin to give us a view of the book and enlighten us all on the subject itself. Professor Gil Martin. Thanks very much. Um, so, stimulating experience. And um, what I'd like to do uh, is j just say a few words about the book, but then move on to talk particularly about the last couple chapters of the book, which uh, deal with the question of partition and its impact on the, the Indus Basin as a whole. This is a question that has come up a bit, um, though we haven't talked that much about it um, directly. So that's what I'd like to focus on. Much of the, the book covers the, the uh, colonial period a bit on the development of irrigation in the Indus Basin before the arrival of the British, but then a particular focus on the 19th century and uh, leading up to the canal colonies that Imran Ali has written about and, and then what happened subsequently. But as I said, the, the, the last part of the book focuses on, on partition. And what I'd like to do is to um, really offer some thoughts, and this uh, builds on what's in the book. Much of this is is covered in the last couple chapters, but I, I give it a slightly different spin here, and I'm uh, sort of trying out the question of how useful it is to talk about the transformations that occur in terms of the question of sovereignty and what we might call sovereign space. Um, so uh, what I have here are a couple maps just juxtaposed to suggest the obvious issue about different ways of viewing space, and, uh, uh, and as I'll argue in a second, uh, space and sovereignty. The, on the right, of course, is a map which makes clear the, the precedence of the nation state and its boundaries as a foundation for our understanding of space. And then on the left, of course, uh, much the same, not exactly the same area, showing a, a, a satellite view of the uh, Indus 
basin itself, which of course gives us a very different view and, and a very different notion of the processes that are involved in thinking about, about space. So, as I said, the question I want to ask is uh, about how the, the idea of sovereignty might be useful in how we interpret these things. And of course, the, the idea of sovereignty is one which has been much debated in the historical literature. In fact, it's a very difficult term to define. But what I'd like to stress is one strand in the writing on sovereignty, which has to do with the notion of authority as a combination of what we might call effective power and legitimate power. So sovereignty, as it's commonly written about, is a concept that combines the notion of uh, authority deriving from the effective character of state abilities to actually control the people in a particular society and to make their power felt, but always subject to the claims of legitimacy that is uh, measures of the um, morality of power that derive from sources that go beyond the exercise of power itself. So uh, sovereignty entails some vision of legitimacy derived from outside the simple exercise of power itself. Um, now that's a bit of a almost mystical concept to think about power. So, so let me let me continue with that. Um, there, there has been a lot of writing in recent years about how the I shouldn't say a lot of writing, some writing about how the concept of sovereignty might be applied to South Asia. And I'm thinking of a couple recent books that I found very stimulating for this purpose. One is Ezra um, Lewin's book about the Mughals, Millennial Sovereignty in which he makes a strong case for the Mughals making claims to sovereignty derived from a, a particular post-Mongol vision of the cosmos uh, shaped by a whole range of hidden forces that manifest themselves in what Moeen calls illumined genealogy, that is the, some sort of divine genealogical manifestation, which, which was the foundation for the Mughals' own claims to, a, to authority. Um, but then, I, I've also been influenced by the work of uh, Mithi Mukherjee on the British claims to sovereignty, uh, which, which very much departed from the Mughal vision, and as she argues, were particularly rooted in a British vision of the autonomy of reason, that is reason itself as a kind of foundation for sovereignty, uh, which was manifested in many ways, including in the British vision of the rule of law, uh, but also in British mobilization of science as a foundation for controlling nature and controlling the environment. Um, now I want to stress again that both the Mughals and the British these legitimizing claims to sovereignty always operated in tension with the actual uh, uh, operation of power in society, which, which hinged on the effective forms of control over the population. But nevertheless, um, the question is 
how does all of this relate to uh, the question of the Indus Basin? And what I want to argue, whoops, So, so um, the river basin itself uh, represents the very idea of the river basin, and I'll say a little bit more about this in a second, is, is a, a concept which can be quite easily related, actually, to ideas about the assertion of sovereignty. In fact, one might even say that the concept of the river basin as a kind of entity for thinking about transformation and domination over nature and society is very much itself a manifestation of an assertion of sovereignty because the river basin is uh, or came to be viewed in, in the late 19th century as this concept was emerging as a, a product of, as I'm suggesting here, nature, science, and imagination that is, on the one hand, it is an independent entity that is defined by nature, and its, its essence lies in that. So there, it, it, it's manifest through a kind of independent, autonomous notion of nature, and yet, of course, it's not constituted entirely by nature on its own. It's constituted by science, and ultimately by imagination uh, as well. And uh, so I draw a bit on the, the work of François Mall on the idea of the river basin, and this quote captures very much what I want to, to get at, um, that very much it's a, the idea of the river basin itself is a kind of expression of uh, an ideal of power. And here, here I, I'm also influenced a bit by uh, the work of the historian Richard White in the U.S. who wrote uh, a very important book on the uh, Columbia River Basin, which he called The Organic Machine, which is, is a kind of phrase that captures this tension between that which is created by man and that which is not, which defines the, the river basin itself. So I want to talk about how this concept of the river basin develops under the British. And, and first to say, uh, one has to begin with the pre-20th century uh, Indus Basin in which, though in fact, a kind of uh, overarching structure of uh, I suppose you might call it natural sequencing, very much shaped the river basin. As was noticed, mentioned earlier, the, the seasonal forms of uh, water flow absolutely shape the structure of canal irrigation. So this map on the left shows the inundation canals. Uh, this is uh, from uh, the second half of the 19th century. Uh, <coughs> And it, but it also suggests the fact that at this period, wells continue to be central to uh, irrigation in, in, in the basin. But, but the major change one can see in the late 19th century, which comes with this idea of the river basin as a systematic entity, and, and perhaps the clearest exposition of this in the documents comes with, with the Indian Irrigation Commission in 1901, <clears throat> when the uh, chief engineer of the Punjab kind of laid out this vision for how irrigation should be uh, approached. And th these are actual 
quotes from his, uh, his report, which um, was, was in significant ways taken to heart, but the point of this was that, that all water flows were interconnected in, in the basin. So the interesting thing is, we talked earlier about the canal colonies. This vision of the river basin in part shapes the canal colonies, but in part it's derived from the can canal colonies. So it, there's not a, a moment when the British sort of decide, well, we need to uh, move away from this more localized irrigation and build the canal colonies. In fact, the, the Chinook colony uh, precedes this statement by uh, Jacob. And in fact, the early development of the Chinook colony does not, in fact, show a whole lot of very systematic thinking. There's a lot of trial and error that went into it. Um, so, so it's the success of the Chinook colony which then empowers this new vision which we just saw with, with Jacob about the uh, a new view of the river basin. But then that really comes to fruition with the emergence of the concept of the Link Canal, which comes to be central to the whole structure of the in this basin, but it's really the Triple Canal project which was completed in 1950, which um, gives Link Canals a pride of place in, in irrigation planning with the uh, upper, Jalen Upper Chenab Canals coming down and linking to the, uh, to the lower Baridoa Canal. So, um, and this, this, with these Link Canals, for the first time, one gets this vision of a kind of engineering model of control over a real system that includes multiple rivers. So uh, growing directly out of this are these ideas of developing plans for rotational opening and closing of, of link canals and moving water from one area to another, which all requires a a, what the British themselves called a systematic view of the river basin. And ultimately, though this takes some time, this comes to completely envelop these older uh, inundation canals as well, which come to be considered in terms of questions of overall flow and uh, water recharge from canals and, and on and on. And so, that, that system really reaches its, its larger scope within the, the whole basin with the, the sudden completion of the Sutter Barrage scheme in Sindh. Um, one has to say that even then, this vision of the river basin is not one that's ever kind of clearly bounded or coterminous with what one would show as a map of the river basin today, as I showed at the beginning, though the um, Northwest Frontier province is very much included in this with the Swat River Canal and the Kabul River Canal and, and Sindh as well. Um, so it's a loosely defined but nevertheless very powerful vision that one gets by this time. So then the big question is, what does partition do to this? What, 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 um, what changes occur and, and how do we think about these changes? And what I'd like to argue here is, I mean, the obvious thing that happens at partition, which of course has been much written about, is, you know, the drawing of the red with line there between Lahore and Amritsar, which splits the river basin in two, and this is normally seen as part of this bifurcation which creates an inherent conflict over resources and control between uh, India and, and Pakistan, with India now assuming the upper riparian position in Pakistan in the situation uh, as the inevitably weaker lower riparian negotiations. And <clears throat> that's, that's not false, but what I would like to suggest that it's much more complicated than that because 
What this division of the river basin does is create new conflicts, new tensions about the meaning of sovereignty and its relationship to the river basin and nature on both sides of the border. And in ways which have deep implications, not just for conflicts within the basin between India and Pakistan, but deep implications for internal conflict within both India and Pakistan, which takes in some ways, very new forms as a result of what happened with the, um, with the um, partition. And, and in my view anyway, the conflicts that occur, in fact, are quite different on the two sides of the border, that they're not, in fact, mirror images of each other. Um, and, and so what I'd like to do for the rest of the, the talk is to explore what happened in India and then what happened in Pakistan and really compare them. And I hope that'll help to understand a bit better the nature of the conflict between uh, India and Pakistan, which in fact has never been simply about the interests of Pakistan versus India, but has been defined by deep internal conflicts on both sides of the water and deriving directly from the, uh, the implications of partition. So, so I want to start with, with India and, and the question of what happens to the river basin in India and uh, about the struggle, what I call the struggle for sovereignty, that the, what we might call, re attempted remaking of the, the river basin on the Indian side. Uh, precipitates. So this is very much bound up with the thinking of Jawaharlal Nehru. And uh, another key element in this is, of course, the Bakra Dam. Both the, there are two different dams, in fact, the lower one and the upper one. But um, just to say, I mean, this, there's been a lot of writing about this, about Nehru, Nehru and the, the Bakra Dam and the relationship of this to a vision of Indian sovereignty that's tied to scientific control over nature. So I'd like to talk about that, but in connection with another project as well that grew out of partition, and that's the Rajasthan Canal. So you can see on this, this map shows uh, the Bakra Dam and the Rajasthan Canal, here labeled the Indira Gandhi Canal as it is today but I'm going to come to this in a second. It was only called the Indira Gandhi Canal from 1984 onward, which was a very politically loaded change of name. And, and so I'll, I'll come to that in a second. But first, to start with the, the Bakra Dam, of course, the most well-known significance in terms of ideology of sovereignty lies in Nehru's famous speech in the early 1950s at the, the opening of the, the lower dam um, about how uh, dams were the temples of the new India that, that making this direct association of the authority of the state and, it, and the clear implication is that it parallels religious authority that's now associated with science and, and development and control over nature that the opening of the Bakra Dam uh, entailed. So there's been a lot of writing on this, and I, I don't want to go into much detail on it, except to say that most of the writing on this has completely ignored the connection of Nehru's speech to what had happened at partition because it was fine for Nehru to say that the Bakra Dam represented a, a sign of dams as the new temples, as if he was associating the sovereignty of the Indian state with its control over nature. One can see this in a way as, as an absolute attempt to appropriate the same vision of sovereignty that we saw the British asserting in their control over the Indus Basin. But the great contradiction in Nehru's speech was that he was a 
asserting this in the context in which the building of the Bakradam had only been enabled by the severing of the river basin. So, without going into detail on this, as many of you may know, the Bakra Dam was a subject of intense controversy before partition. Uh, its, its first proposing went back decades, and it was at the center of a series of commissions in, in the 1930s and 40s that had dealt with the problem of how the waters of the Indus were to be distributed between the provincial units that made up the system. And at the heart of this was the conflict between Sindh and Punjab. Um, and, and in fact, the Bakra Dam had been delayed because of this problem. Um, and, and it had become a major issue in, in Punjab politics, for example, um, uh, well, without going into the detail, so, but, but, but the point was that once the basin was severed, then suddenly the Bakra Dam had no obstacles that, to face on those grounds. And Nehru, it's quite incredible if you read his speech now, and after asserting that, you know, the new state sovereignty is tied to nature and it's as if, you know, we're now in tune with, with how nature operates in the river basin, He's utterly dismissive of the claims of Pakistan or the claims of Sindh to, to the continuing uh, use of water from this. And, and there's a good reason for that. And that is, and here we're back into Indian politics and conflicts, because there was extreme tension at this time between the central government and the government of the Punjab. And there was a major issue having to do with Sikh politics and, and their claims for autonomy. And the, the Bakra Dam was a central uh, mechanism by which Nehru was projecting his own, not just dams as temples, but his own claim to legitimacy through bringing water to Punjab. Uh, and, and the Bakra Dam was the absolute centerpiece of, of this scheme. So this dwarfed any concern with, with the, the river basin as a whole, even though Nehru himself was, in fact, I mean, it, it would be wrong to convey the impression that he was oblivious to the claims of Pakistan, because he was not. In fact, comparatively speaking among Indian leaders, he was quite sympathetic to the need to deal with the, what had happened at partition, but nevertheless, the politics of this in Punjab overwhelmed us. So that's the Bakra Dam, but, but the other side of this is, is critical, which uh, um, the, the major new irrigation work on the Indian side that is a direct product of partition is this huge Rajasthan Canal. As I said, what smart Indira Gandhi Canal. So this is, uh, I believe, was the largest irrigation project uh, in India, a, a, a huge canal taking off the, the Sutledge at the Harike Barrage and then running down more or less parallel to the border into the desert uh, in Rajasthan. Now this canal took decades to develop, so it opened in stages over a very long period of time. So one shouldn't imagine it was built right away. But it was, it, it was of all the projects that followed partition on the Indian side, it was the one most associated with a kind of Indian national claim to take control of the river basin, uh, the Indus River Basin, and assert uh, authority over it. And that's because one of the big arguments about the division of waters at partition was the argument that, you know, uh, Pakistan got all these canal colonies, that, that there had been all this development, and now, but in fact, colonial development, in fact, had been disproportionately focused on the lands in western Punjab 
that went to Pakistan. And therefore, the argument is directly made that East Punjab, the eastern side of the, the, the border, had been neglected. And therefore, they had a claim to, to remedy that imbalance. And the, the, um, the Rajasthan Canal was the great example of that because if you look at the rhetoric surrounding this canal, it was directly projected as remaking the canal colonies now on the Indian side of the border. So this claim to control nature in terms of, you know, what, what uh, Jim was talking about a second ago, making the desert bloom uh, as a kind of ideology of state sovereignty and state authority, that had to be redone with partition on the Indian side. So, and, and of course, this this um, this uh, project um, it, it, it today is. I mean, these are some pictures of it. Is is one of the the major uh, legacies of, of partition. But what this generated was a huge and growing controversy. Whoops. In, in, um, in India about the reconstruction of what they call the, you know, the system of the eastern rivers of the Indus Basin. That is, uh, somebody mentioned earlier today about the Indus Basin as one of the largest river basins in India, but the Indus Basin, in the form that made any sense as a natural river basin, was gone. So this was a, a self-conscious attempt to, to turn the eastern rivers, which now, you know, did not flow to the sea. They flowed to a border in the imagination of them. That this had to be turned into a system, and a new system of division had to be laid out for this. So this came even before the Indus Waters Treaty. Um, in fact, the outlines of the treaty had been laid out by the World Bank in 1954. And following that, India, on the assumption that this was going to be signed, though it took another five years for that to happen. Um, but anyway, there was an interstate water agreement uh, in 1955. And the, the interesting thing here is that the, the larger share of the waters that were involved went not to East Punjab, but went to Rajasthan for this huge Rajasthan Canal project, which represents the, the beginning of, I mean, in fact, it begins instantly after partition. That's another story, but it's the beginning of a long-running conflict over, over water. And, it gets reflected again in the later 1981 agreement where once again Rajasthan gets the big share of it now and interestingly for what's going to happen later Jammu and Kashmir gets hardly any share at all of this so it's not built into this agreement which is a subsequently becomes a big issue but but in 1981, of course, this gets um, uh, split now between Punjab and Haryana, uh, which are, of course, divided in the, in the 1960s into two separate states. So um, the conflict with Rajasthan continues, but meanwhile, for this share, Punjab and Haryana begin to uh, debate what's going on, and this all comes to focus, I mean, to make a complicated story slightly, but probably not sufficiently shorter, uh, in a huge conflict that develops about what was called the Sutledge Young Link Canal. So of course, as we discussed a few minutes ago, Link Canals were the absolute foundation for creating a, an effective river basin vision. But the problem with the Sutledge Young Link Canal, which was the canal which was supposed to carry water uh, from the Sutledge 
in Punjab to Haryana was that the argument was now made by Punjab, who already was in conflict with Rajasthan, that this carried water out of the river basin. Because, of course, the Yamuna River is not in the Indus Basin, it's, it flows into the Ganges and is part of the Ganges River Basin. So the river basin now becomes a kind of ideological argument that this is the, the source of sovereign authority over water, so if water is uh, being taken out of the river basin, this is a problem. And this picture on the lower left there is uh, part of the, the, the Sutlej Yamuna Canal, which, of course, um, if any of you know this story, was built and has been dry for some decades because it was built in Haryana but not in Punjab. So it never actually was able to receive um, water. So, so that was compounded by the story of the Rajasthan Canal. And this all came to a head in 1984 when Indira Gandhi was assassinated, as, as you all know, by her Sikh bodyguards. And this was connected with this Khalistan demand in Punjab. And one of the first things the Indian government did was to rename the Rajasthan Canal, the Indira Gandhi Canal. This was not simply a tribute to Indira Gandhi. This was a deliberate slap in the face of Punjab to say that this canal that you dispute is a national canal, which in effect it had been all, all along. So um, this conflict continued, but I just want to, to show a, a quote here which comes from, uh, I believe, around 2004, 2005, uh, which suggests one of the arguments that was made in Punjab uh, against Haryana's claims, which continue to be resisted, and, and against Rajasthan's claim. And the interesting here, thing here is the evocation is of the river basin as a form of resistance to the national claims of the government. That is, it's the river basin, even though the reference here is to the five rivers that no longer are, are in the United India, but it's the lost river basin which is now projected as a claim to, to, uh, to water for the Punjab, precisely against the Indian government. So again, it's a, it's a sovereignty issue that, that Punjab is claiming a, a right which is rooted in the fact that their claim is, is based on something that's actually outside India itself. That is the idea of the old, of the old river basin. And this, um, just to show you, this continues right up to the present. So this is only from a couple months ago, where this ongoing story about the Sutlej German Canal, um, the Punjab government moved recently to try to denotify all the land which had originally been taken over for this canal a couple decades ago. And um, the issue um, continues. So, what I want to do is to contrast this now with the question of sovereignty as it relates to what happens in Pakistan. And so in Pakistan, of course, the river basin also has to be reconstructed. Um, and that's because, as this map shows rather dramatically here, we have these uh, rivers which are cut off. They're, they're, the sources of their water are, are lost, and, and the river basin has to be, um, once again, reimagined, in a sense, which involves a reimagination of nature linked to state policy. Um, but the interesting thing in Pakistan 
is that the, the, what really precipitates a particular approach to this is what happens in, uh, in early 1948, in, on April 1st, 1948, actually, when uh, the, the flow of water across the border is actually stopped. And it's often said in the literature that it was stopped by India. But in fact, the evidence is pretty clear it was not stopped by India. It was stopped by the government of East Punjab. And, and all accounts suggest that Nehru himself was furious at, at this. Uh, so the interesting thing about that is if you look at the reasons why the water was stopped, and then this is from early May when the, the water blockade, as it was called, was lifted. Um, the action of the East government stopping the flow to Pakistan was as much a challenge to the government of India as it was to Pakistan. That is, they were doing this to make a statement to Nehru that who is it who has control of this water? Who's, who's the sovereign authority when it comes to this water? And, um, and as I said, um, Nehru himself, the accounts are, was, was, you know, called a meeting of engineers that what's going on. They apparently, the government of India, had not been informed in, a, in advance of this. But it creates a certain dynamic for Pakistan. So how does Pakistan respond to this? Well, there are these rushed negotiations in Delhi in order to get the water restarted again. And those involve, I mean, those are complicated and involve several concessions by Pakistan, as the Pakistanis later argued, under duress. But, but the interesting thing is the, the, what this really prompts is the, a, an approach to the border which involves the construction of this huge new canal that here you can see, I mean, not very far from where we are right now, that runs right along the border. Um, and this is the, the BRBD canal, uh, which, which was begun in a frenzy after uh, uh, May 1948. And, but the interesting thing about it is the canal was from the beginning a national canal. The, the claim was that this canal is necessary because we're under threat from India to stop the flow of water. And therefore, it involved not just engineers planning a canal off in you know, government offices. The whole idea was the people themselves had to be mobilized to construct this canal. It was linking a, a vision of Pakistan to a kind of new sovereign vision of a nation that would have control over its own water. So these are, I'm sorry, the quality of these isn't very good because they're just taken from copies of the newspaper, but um, there were all of these um, uh, villages that were mobilized in, in canal construction along the route with these, uh, you know, ministers such as uh, Muntaz Sultana, who went out and gave, you know, exhortatory speeches about this needs to be done for the nation. Um, this is um, uh, students from Lahore who went out with their, you know, hose and shovels to, to dig the canal, and it was all part of a, a popular, uh, a popular mobilization, which very much involved a kind of vision of sovereignty that this is a national canal. And of course, this all got played out even further during the 1965 war, when this was the Ghazi Canal that, that you know, saved the city because it was built right all, all, along, the, uh, along the border. So this is one clear kind of way that a new national vision of sovereignty around water is being created. But of course, as you might guess, 
um, this vision of popular mobilization is one which, from the very beginning, makes lots of political leaders and engineers very nervous. You know, it, with the canal planning and construction should not be done, after all, in a scientific way by bringing, you know, huge mobilizations of people at the last minute to dig these canal sections. And, and so, although this was a big effort, there was, there was a lot of critique of it as well. And, and so the much more prominent thing that came out of this was the, the need for authoritarian control because this process of remaking the river basin was so central to um, uh, Punjabi national, I'm sorry, Pakistani national identity. So this goes back, you know, this is a quote from, from Ayub Khan. Uh, this is well before he came to power. Uh, and it's at the time of the creation of one unit. Which, so I believe this is from late 1954. I'm sorry, I didn't put the date on it. But it's once again this idea that the very importance of the river basin to sovereignty requires a new kind of political control. And that politics is dangerous because it threatens the integrity of the river basin as a whole. And this comes to be a very prominent uh, element, and this is well before the, the, the Indus Waters Treaty, so, I mean, this is reflected in the formation of WAPTA in the late 1950s, but it's most dramatically reflected in what actually came out of the Indus Basin Treaty, which was the huge Indus Basin project. So I, I don't want to say a whole lot about the Indus Waters Treaty, because so much has been written about it. But just to say that if one is considering this treaty, you know, and the question as to whether India benefited or Pakistan benefited as far as whatever the arrangements were, but it's very clear that the arrangements, the, the water arrangements of the treaty were only accepted by Pakistan because there was a huge payoff this, this, that came from foreign uh, money from a huge range of donors and from the World Bank to uh, uh, fund this Indus Basin project, which was the largest irrigation project in world history at that time. And, and so this, this once again, uh, it not only centralized this national sovereignty, but it made it clear that to remake the river basin to assert this sovereignty, huge amounts of money were going to be necessary, and the money came primarily from abroad. India actually was supposed to pay part of this, and, but, but mostly what India, India's share was uh, paid by others in their place to get them to accept it. So in any case, all of this then created a, a new framework for centralized authority. And, and just quickly to, to finish up here, what I'd like to suggest is that this led to a whole series of controversies in Pakistan, once again focused, as in India, around link canals, which were the key to this idea of a river basin. But they took a very different form in Pakistan. So though there are many controversies, um, but um, long before the controversy uh, of, about the Kalabagh Dam began, the, probably the most central controversy had to do with the Chushman Jail and Lincoln Allen. This is a controversy, of course, which continues to the present day. And of course, the reason for this is that the canal is uh, built to transfer water from the Indus, the main stem Indus, to the Jalem, from where it can be transferred down to uh, other link canals to, uh, to the, the areas in southern Punjab, which had previously been served by the, by the eastern uh, rivers. Um, so, uh, 
just an aerial view of the Chashma Barrage. Uh, so, so this is critical, but the point is um, this, this created a, a huge controversy, particularly this became the focus for Cindy opposition. Um, but, but the interesting thing is the degree to which the language surrounding this in some way mimics, but in other ways completely challenges what was going on in India with this. So um, the interesting thing first here is that if the, the BRBD canal was the, uh, the Ghazi canal, uh, the, the uh, Chashma Jalen Link canal is now a robber canal. This is the canal by which Punjab is stealing the water of sin. But the interesting thing here is the, the, the play here, the river basin idea, here has taken on a completely different meaning. So sin's claim does not lie in its assertion of the natural integrity of the river basin. It lies in a claim to the Indus River itself, which is uh, imaginatively pulled out of the river basin as a river that really belongs to Sindh. And that it's the, this construction of the river basin going back to Wai'u, which we talked about, which is the threat. So it's quite the opposite of the way resistance had developed in, in East Punjab. So, so the Indus River itself now is given all kinds of symbolic meanings, and um, one can see this, of course, in a whole series of controversies um, about, about this. And, and, and again, the key here is that, and, and this relates to Kalabog as well, it, it, it's, it's the symbolic issue about the Indus as a separate river is the emotional key to this, so that even though, you know, once it gets beyond Panchanat, a, a, a drop of water that flows into the Indus, having come down the Chenab, is going to look no different at Sukkur than a drop of water coming down from Kalabag, but nevertheless, it's, it, it's a completely differently culturally constructed drop of water. In, in the framework of this controversy. So I, I'd like to, to just stop there, but just to say I tried to raise some questions about this concept of sovereignty and how it might help us to rethink the nature of all of these controversies since partition uh, about the river basin. So thanks very much.